Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Explore Classroom. My name is Jordan Lim. I work at the National Geographic Society. I'm on the education team. I'm so happy that all of you could join us today. Um, looks like we've got a good range of classes joining us in the Google Hangout from the US and Canada. And I know that there's some friends also on YouTube Live. And so hi to all of you guys that are watching, uh, not in the Hangout, but live via YouTube. Um, today, we have Jenny Adler with us today. I'm going to say a little bit about her before I swing it over. Um, Jenny is a conservation photographer, cave diver, and National Geographic Young Explorer, and she has spent most of her life in or surrounded by the water. Her love for the ocean while growing up inspired her to study marine biology, and later she worked as a biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Florida. Um, she does a lot of work connecting students and communities with the reefs and aquifers that they live nearby. And um, thank you so much for joining once again, everyone. Uh, we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A after Jenny goes over um, her slides, and she's also going to show us some fun cameras. So yes, thank you all for participating. I'm going to swing it over to Jenny. Awesome. Thanks so much. Can you guys all hear me? We're good? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm really excited to be here with you guys today and share some of the work that I do. And um, so like Jordan said, I am a conservation photographer, but my background is in science. And so I use this background in science to inform my imagery. And essentially, I'm a science storyteller. And so there's so much fascinating science that happens out there, but a lot of it doesn't get communicated. And if it does, sometimes it's not in a way that people can understand. And so I use photos to help communicate science. So I'm going to now share my screen with you guys and hopefully this works. Let's see. Okay. Oh, let's see here. Is that working for you guys? You're good. Okay, cool. So basically when people think of scientists, a lot of times, I'm sure a lot of you have cell phones, you think of things like this, people in white lab coats with crazy things boiling in beakers. But I also want to show that this is also what scientists do. And so this is a scientist in the Itchituckney River in Florida collecting turtles. And this is an endangered species of turtle. And so you're not allowed to touch this unless you have a permit, but basically, these scientists go out into the water and collect, these are called swanee cooters, and they are vegetarian turtles, so they eat stuff like the grass that you can see in the background of this picture, and the water here is really clear. It's coming from freshwater springs in Florida, where I do a lot of my work, and so I try to tell the behind-the-scenes story of what goes on when these scientists are in the field collecting data, which in this case is, is turtles, and so they swim in some water that can sometimes look a little bit murky, like this guy here swimming in a spring on the Santa Fe River. And here he is catching a turtle. And so they're pretty fast. You have to be really on your toes to be able to get them. And they'll, they'll try to get away from you, but you know, they can, they'll grab them. And then sometimes you find things that are not swanee cooters. And this is a common snapping turtle. It kind of looks like, you know, a dinosaur of the water here. And it's actually being held. You can see the scientist's hands here along the outside edges. And they have to hold them very carefully because their neck can actually go back almost to the back of their shell. So if you put your hand on the back of their shell, they can whip their head backwards and they could grab your fingers, which would end very poorly. So they try to hold them appropriately. And um, as you can see, they're swimming pretty fast in this kind of dark, murky water. And so the scientists that go out there are, are pretty brave and um, they're keeping their eyes out for alligators a lot of the times too. And so part of what I do is really document the rest of the process of science too. And so these scientists are in the water collecting these turtles and then they take them back on land and these turtles will sit in buckets for a little while while they wait their turn. And then they look at each turtle and they'll look, for example, to see if some of them have eggs or if they have, this girl here is looking for notches on the shell because they'll put notches in different parts of the shell that will tell them basically what number the turtle is in certain places and so then they can go back and collect them later and understand where they've been or maybe where the last time they saw that particular turtle was. And so when the turtles are being processed, you can think of it kind of as bringing, if you have a pet, bringing it to the vet. Right here, this girl with the little, looks like a nail polish uh, wand in her hand there, 
she's putting in what we call a pit tag. And for any of you that have dogs or cats that have microchips in them, it's a really similar concept to that. And so when you bring next time they go and catch turtles, they can use this wand type thing that will read the number that's in that turtle and they can tell where the last time they caught it was or when they, you know, where they saw it last, like what type of habitat it was using or maybe how old it was when they uh, caught it last time and they can count the number of years and really understand how the turtles are using different habitats like springs in rivers. Each turtle, they also take measurements on their shells. So they can calculate how much they've grown in a certain amount of time. And then they release the turtles back into the water, as you can see here. And so this is a, a pretty relatively small one. And then this is releasing a larger turtle on the Itchitucknee River. And these turtles, you can see the water in a lot of these pictures is very clear. And they're living in these freshwater springs. And this is where a lot of my work happens. And these springs are, are really important because in Florida, they actually get water from the aquifer and there's more than a thousand of them. And the water from the aquifer actually get, supplies water to more than nine out of 10 people in Florida. And you can see here, aquifers are pretty invisible from the surface, but this is a map of the United States. I apologize to our friends in Canada. And <laughs> this is from the US Geological Survey, so there's uh, doesn't have any of the Canadian aquifers, but the different colors here actually represent different color rock are different types of rock that are underneath the surface. So for those of you tuning in from Texas, you can see here that there's a couple different types of rock aquifers in Texas. One of the most famous ones is labeled here number 11 in light blue, the Ogallala Aquifer. And I am down over here in Florida. And what makes Florida unique is that it has more than 1,000 of these springs and you can actually jump into these springs and swim directly into the aquifer to experience what it's like underground in these winding freshwater tunnels. At the surface where you would enter the aquifer through these springs, this is what it looks like. And so this very clear water, there's some plants around the edges, there's kind of a deep part where when you swim down in towards the deep part below the girl there in the pink shirt, you would enter down into an underwater cave. When you swim down into the cave, uh, one thing I like to do is get different perspectives when I jump in to show people what it looks like from different angles. So from the surface, the springs look very clear and beautiful, but when you dive down in and look back up towards the sky, these trees are you know, more than 50 feet overhead because I'm almost 30 feet underwater in this picture, but the water is so clear that it looks like you can you know, see the top of the trees and you know, it almost just looks like my friend here is, is falling out of the sky. And so besides the fact that a lot of Floridians rely on water from the aquifer that are also is also coming up at these springs, you know, there's this delicate balance between humans and ecosystems and the organisms that live in these ecosystems. And so we have to be really cognizant that what we do at the surface and what we do, like the way that we use water can impact the springs and the aquifer and the organisms that live there. So one of people's favorite things that lives in the springs uh, for at least part of the year are manatees. And you can see this is a Florida manatee and it came right up its nose is actually touching the dome on my camera. And so they're very curious and it kind of swam out of this murky water to come say hello. And manatees are eat about 10% of their body weight in vegetation every day and they can be so for example let's say it was a thousand pound manatee it could eat a hundred pounds of vegetation in a day so that's a pretty crazy amount of um, of plants that have to be available for these creatures and they'll come into the springs in pretty large numbers in the winter months because the springs are 72 degrees year round but the ocean gets a lot colder than that in the winter, even here in Florida. And so they'll, even though they look like they have a lot of extra, um, maybe blubber on them, like a seal or a whale or something, they actually don't have a blubber layer. And so they have to stay in warm water so that they can actually stay warm enough and not, and not freeze. Something else that lives in the springs that's kind of neat are these fish called mullet. And if you look just beneath the surface, these ecosystems are really unique because it looks like you're swimming kind of through a forest here, but there's this really clear water coming up and coming up through from the aquifer that supports uh, neat types of fish like these mullet. Another kind of unexpected thing you can see underwater in some of the springs is our birds that are actually look like, you know, almost like they're flying through this water. And this is a uh, 
double crested cormorant. And if anyone lives near the ocean or has been around the ocean and you see these blackbirds that stand out with their wings kind of out in a tee, letting them dry out, uh, that might be a cormorant. And they go down and he'll use diving down into the grasses here to look for, for fish and stuff. And there's another type of bird that's pretty similar to a cormorant. Uh, and one of the ways you can tell the difference is if you look at the very tip of the beak here, you can see that there's a little curve kind of hook that goes down. And the anhinga, which is a, a similar bird, has a straight beak that it kind of used to help spear the fish that it eats. I want to share with you guys a couple quick stories today about some of the science projects that I've documented over the past couple of years. And the that gives you a little bit of a better idea of the amazing work that these scientists are doing that is outside the lab, out in the field, and kind of the kind of help you connect to them as people rather than just as being scientists and kind of not really knowing exactly what scientists do. And this is a project that I shot in Silver Springs uh, in Florida. So it's about an hour south of where I live in Gainesville. And this is at and well, the sun hasn't risen yet, so it's probably around 5 a.m. And you can still see the stars are out and the lights there that are kind of painting the river are actually the lights of scientists that are coming up the river towards the spring. And so some of them have slept for maybe two hours and they've, they've come up here to do an experiment in the water and they actually jump in the water. So this is in the, the main spring area and they have this kind of crazy floating alien looking thing, which is just a, a kind of pool noodles that are wrapped around something with lights on it. And it floats around this frame so that they can see what they're doing when they first jump in the water. And I should also mention that this water is kind of notorious for having a lot of alligators in it. So we had to shine the lights around and look for their eyes kind of light up in the, when you shine the light out. And so if you see their light eyes shining in your lights, you know, maybe not to jump in the water right there or to wait until they move. And right as the sun rises, the scientists go in and they take this long blue hose and they release dye. And so this is a non-toxic dye called rhodamine WT and the WT stands for water tracing. And they release this dye into the water. And this here is Nathan Reaver. He is a PhD student at the University of Florida and he was conducting this study as part of his graduate research and he's diving down here to check on the dye as it comes out and it sort of comes out in this big billowing orangey red color and spreads out throughout the spring and one thing I like to try to capture is that is when science can be beautiful and so you can have these reflections in these beautiful patterns created by this dye and you can kind of help get people interested in science that aren't hydrologists because the hydrological equations behind a lot of what's happening here is really complex and it's going to be published in maybe a hydrology journal but not very many of us sit down every day to read a hydrology journal so I hope that communicating these same concepts through pictures can help other people uh, like students like you guys and also people in the general public and maybe even um, you know some of my friends or policymakers or managers really understand what this science is doing and that it, that it is also really fascinating and interesting. So here's Nathan again swimming along the edge as the dye takes over the spring and then eventually the whole spring turns orange and what they do is they follow the dye as it goes out the river and they take samples as they go so they can tell how long it took the dye to travel to a certain place in the river and how fast it, um, it, it spreads out and essentially where the water starts going because in Florida a lot of rivers will flow underground for a little while so you can kind of watch where it will go under and come back up and how long that takes and they can also tell different things about the nutrients and the cycling nutrient cycling in the river that happens through this process as well and here are some of the scientific divers surfacing and you can see when the light starts to come through the dye as it kind of flows downstream it, it starts to take on a little bit of a purplish hue so it's kind of neat but I keep I think saying this word aquifer and it can be a really confusing concept especially when you tell people if you look it up the definition will say something like rock saturated with water and it's like, wait a minute, how can there be water in a rock? And one way to think about it is in Florida, most of our aquifers are made up by limestone. And this limestone is looks kind of like Swiss cheese. It actually has holes in it. And these holes are, are where the water is held. And one way that we can get a better idea of what an aquifer is, is actually to swim into an aquifer. So like I said, in Florida, there's more than a thousand of these springs and you can swim directly from the springs 
into the aquifer and experience it for yourself to understand where this drinking water is coming from and how get a better understanding of how the surface in our lives at the surface connect down to the aquifer that's literally beneath our feet. So when you're at the springs, this is Jenny Springs uh, in, in Florida, and this is what you see at the springs. So the clear water in the foreground is water that's coming out of the freshwater springs, and then the kind of dark water in the background where that buoy is with the arrow pointing at it, that's the Santa Fe River, and it's what we call tannic. And so it has basically tannic acids in it, which are, if you think about taking clear water from the pot that you boil and then sticking a tea bag in it, it kind of gets stained that brown color. That's exactly what's happening here, except for instead of a tea bag, a lot of the stuff from the floodplain, like leaves that have fallen on the ground, will stain the water kind of dark colored like tea like that. And that's what gives it the dark color compared to the clear fresh water coming out of the aquifer. So this buoy here is actually chained to the entrance to an underwater cave. So like you can see from the surface, it's really kind of impossible to see this aquifer because it's hidden underground. Let's take a bird's eye view of that same exact spot that we were just looking at and you can see the clear water at the bottom again coming out from the the trees and then near that that roof there and then on the upside again we have the santa fe river flowing by and this white arrow is pointing at that same buoy that's at the end of it and you can kind of make out here a dark circle right where the buoy is and that is where you swim down into the cave but even from looking at this spot from a bird's eye view, what you really cannot see from looking at this is, is this. And this is the mapped cave passageways that lie underneath the river and underneath the forest here. So you can actually swim down into that hole where the buoy is and swim into all of these different cave passageways. And the really cool thing is that this is only the first several hundred feet of more than six miles of mapped underground cave that you can access just from swimming in this one hole. And then there's a little hole um, at the bottom, very bottom end of the um, aquifer or the cave map here too. So these two entrances that are like less than 100 feet apart can access more than six miles of cave. And this river here, the Santa Fe River, tons and tons of people, thousands of people will float down that river on tubes during the summer months. So they're floating right over these caves, but most of them have absolutely no idea. So I thought, okay, how can I show them what it looks like down there? And I picked a couple locations within the cave. And in order to help people feel like they're immersed there, I created a 360 virtual tour of the aquifer. So if any of you guys have ever used Google Street View, just think of it as Google Street View where you can click from one place to the next and then you get a little 360 sphere at each of those places. It's that, but in an underwater cave. When you're in the cave, this is what it looks like. And this was when we were shooting the virtual tour. And you can see this is my dive buddy, Harry, who is also actually my cave diving instructor um, a couple of years, a number of years ago. And he is um, holding on to a rock and moving some lights around. And so when I said that there's this limestone that has holes in it that holds water, some of these holes are very big and they're big enough for us to swim through. So this is actually an underwater passageway winding through the aquifer and this is where we go when we cave dive. When we go in and take the pictures, this is what it looks like when I stitch together about six to eight pictures to make this 360 view. And I can send you guys a link to the virtual tour if you don't already um, have it. And basically this image, when you put it into software on the computer, it kind of wraps around and you can click around and interact with it and click through the aquifer. So you can actually enter the water and then click to go into the spring and swim through the passageway. And to give you a little bit of scale, you can see on your left, there's a diver there. And then some of the lights are the things with the orange tape wrapped around them. And then the sign on the right is called the Grim Reaper sign. It's a little white square there. And that's at near the entrance to almost every cave in Florida that's that's dove by cave divers and basically it says do not continue past this point or you could could die and if you don't have the certification you shouldn't go beyond that point because it's very easy as you can tell a lot of these passageways look very similar and kind of it would be very easy to get turned around and, and lose sight of where you're going. This is what the virtual tour looks like when you first bring it up. So you're starting actually in the freshwater near that buoy that I just showed you a picture of. This is one of the, the other entrance that I mentioned where you go down into the aquifer. And I don't think a video will play very well through live streams. So if you want to check out the aquifer later, uh, you can through this is what the beginning screen will look like. So 
these 360 underwater photos, that's maybe sounds kind of crazy. And so I want to show you how I do that and give you a little bit of a background on, on what it takes to dive in and take some of these photos. This is a screenshot from a video of me taking the pictures. And so that's me on the right holding the camera and it's on a tripod. And you can see that the camera is inside this housing with a big glass dome on the front. And then we've lit up all of the, uh, the rock. This is that same limestone rock. And the stuff you can see on the ceiling is actually escaped air bubbles. So when we exhale, all of the bubbles go up and kind of get trapped on the ceiling. And they reflect. So they're kind of like little mirrors on the ceiling. And I'm going to spin this camera around on the tripod and take pictures in all directions. So I'll take about six pictures around in a circle, spinning it all the way around, and then I'll pick it up and take a picture of the ceiling and a picture of the ground so that when I stitch all the photos together later on the computer, you can have that full 360 degree view of being able to look in all directions. And this is what I look like when I'm doing it. So I have all of this gear on, which I'm going to show you in one second in, in real life. And so I have this thing in my mouth is called a regulator. It's attached to tanks. And so unlike open water diving where you'd have a tank on your back, you can see the two white things that are on my side. Those are actually two tanks that I'm, I'm breathing off of. And I have two regulators as well. And so you switch between two regulators that are attached to your two tanks to get air out of both of those. And... I, you can see near my right hand, so on your left side of the screen, there's a little line, and that's what you follow into the cave, and we're going to take a look at that in real life now. So I'm going to go off of my screen share and give you guys a look at this. Okay, can you see me again? Cool. All right, let's see. I'm going to take my headphones out too, so... All right, let's take a look at this. Okay, perfect. So here we have the camera. And so this is the same camera you just saw in that picture. And essentially it's got a big cover on the glass dome right now. So we'll take that cover off. And then you can see what it looks like in there. And so inside of this is just a regular camera. So I'm going to take it out and show you what that camera looks like. Basically, we have just a regular, so if you've ever heard of a DSLR, just a regular um, DSLR camera. And so it has a lens on it, and it just looks like your normal camera that lives in there. And it has this lens, it's called the fisheye lens on it. And what it can do is it can see 180 degrees from left to right. So if I were to take a picture right now, it would see all the way over to the left and all the way over to the right as well. And that helps us me later stitch the pictures together better in um, when I'm making the 360 images. And perhaps the most important part of these 360 images, one of the pieces that I had to make that doesn't look very exciting but it, it's really important is this piece here and this allows me to rotate the camera around in a circle without it moving so what it does is it screws into the bottom part of the camera here there's some holes and these screws screw right into this hole and then i take the whole setup that's on that like i showed you in the picture and it screws into this tripod at the top and then this whole piece i'll take underwater with me to take the images in the caves and that line that I was showing you guys in there as well is really important because it helps us not get lost. And so one other thing we use when we're in the caves is, these, so this is called a reel, or this is called a spool, and it looks similar to a reel, except the reel looks just like a fishing reel, and you can have a thing on the side where you get to go like this. And so when we're going in, we use this and trail it behind us, sort of like Hansel and Gretel left breadcrumbs. Uh, with this, you leave a rope that you can then follow later to get out. So that's super important. Another thing that we use is uh, line arrows. And so on the line, when we leave the line behind us, we would put this on, and this always points to the closest exit to the cave. So if you're ever lost in a cave, which you shouldn't be in there unless you're a cave diver anyways, but any, anyhow, if you're in there and you see one of these, this, is, this points to the closest exit to the cave. So we always carry these with us so we can put them there to show ourselves the way out. Another thing we need is a computer. So it doesn't look much like your regular computer, but it's a dive computer. And we wear it on our wrist, just like a watch. And it tells us the depth that we're at and how long we've been there and how much longer we can safely be there 
uh, underwater. And so that, that's pretty essential to our diving as well. And then one thing that's really important for me is um, you saw a lot of the pictures of the aquifer and they were all beautifully lit up with nice colors and everything. But actually the aquifer is pitch black when you're in there and you can see absolutely nothing. And so these lights are really, really important. And I have to have in some of the pictures in the aquifer virtual tour, there's up to 12 lights lighting up the, the images. So this is what I use and it's very, very bright. And this is also waterproof. And this is actually, I don't have my, my big lights out right now, but this is the smallest light that I use. Some of them are almost just, you know, as big as my camera. And so this is what we would, would put out to do that. Lastly, um, this is probably one of the most important pieces too for seeing underwater. So I have to wear the mask like this and I'll actually put it on like this. This is what I wear underwater. And then you have to wear your snorkel if you're snorkeling on the surface like this. But if you're going to go diving, you have to actually bring out your regulators. So this is what you saw in my mouth in the other picture. And so this attaches to your air supply. And then you take this thing, you put it in your mouth, and then you breathe off of it like that. And so this is the only way that you're allowed, you're able to breathe underwater. So this is incredibly important. So, and then on my feet, if you've ever, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen fins, but these are super heavy duty fins because there's a lot of flow in the cave. So they're kind of like really heavy, big fins that you wear on your feet. And when you swim against the flow, they help you kick really fast. There's like a strong current in the cave. And on the way out, you can use them to kind of um, go sail with, with the current, which is kind of nice. So gives you a little bit of a background and let me take this off and whoop. then we will I'll just have like two more minutes of wrap up and then I'll take your your questions so let's see did that work again you're good cool thanks so one other thing that I do that um, to try to help other people get excited about the water is bring them into it. So I created a program as part of a National Geographic grant uh, in 2016 that actually brings students from Florida out to the springs to help them um, experience them firsthand. And a lot of them have never seen a spring before, even though it's their source of drinking water. And so I take them out to the springs so that they can experience it on their own. And I give them cameras so that they can document the ecosystems through their own lens because I think it gives them their own voice and they can be part of the story, um, part of their own story as well. And rather than just seeing my photos, they get to experience it on their own. They also get to check out what cool life lives there. So this turtle is actually the same type of turtle that you saw in my pictures with the scientists. This is another Swanee Cooter. And some of these students are uh, some of the kids that I took out to the water, uh, into the water last year. And some of the things they maybe don't like quite as much, this is I'm um, showing a crayfish molt to one of the students. And so crayfishes are basically, they look a lot like lobsters, but they, they'll live in freshwater. And there's some really cool crayfish that live in the springs, especially in the caves. They are all white. They're like albino cave crayfish because they've adapted to living in the dark environment. And then something else cool that we saw on one of the trips with a snake swimming through the water, you can actually see all of the students swimming in the background there. Some of them didn't even know it was, was uh, swimming by. And so this is a harmless, uh, non-venomous, uh, just water snake that was, that was swimming down. And it didn't really like us that much. It kind of swam away pretty quickly, but I snapped this picture before it got too far away from us. And so I want to show you this, these a few photos to tie it up. And then I'm going to ask you guys at the end to try to maybe tell me why you think this happened. And so I, one thing that I use photos for is to document changes in these underwater places over time. And this is what it, this is called Blue Spring, and this is what it looked like in January 2017. And I went back to this exact same spot in January 2018, so just like um, about a month ago, and this is what it looked like. So you have this grass, flowing green grass, and then you have all this and all the grass is gone and you can see a big clump of algae. This is another photo from 2017 when you can see all the grass and then my friend swimming by there. And this is the same place in 2018. So you can see those same two, the same logs that are there, but all of the grass is completely gone. And then you can see swimming back up the spring here 
in 2017, and then again in 2018. So all the grass was gone. And then one more example, this is in a different part of the spring. You can see some turtles down there in the uh, sand. And then this is the same exact spot. And I know it's hard to believe this is the same spot, but if you look over on the left here in both pictures, you can see those green plants. You can see that they're there in both of the pictures. And so all this algae has come and grown in the same spot. So I'm wondering what you guys think caused these changes. And so um, if you wanna help me answer that question and then also ask me some questions um, now. That'd be awesome. So I'll take this off and. Great, Jenny, thank you so much for sharing. That was an awesome presentation. I definitely appreciate how you not only showed us some of the gear that you use for the science part of your work, but also some of the gear that you use for the storytelling part of your work. So that's super, super awesome. And thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm so excited to do it. Great. So we are now going to move into the Q&A session, and you had a awesome prompt for the students. So I'm gonna read out the order of the classes that we're gonna go through, and you can definitely ask a question that you have already that you might have thought about last night or just now, um, but also if you have an answer or a guess, an estimated guess for why, um, for Jenny's prompt about you know, what caused this environmental change, feel free to include that when you come to the mic. So I'll give the order here of the classes so you guys have a little bit of a heads up. We're gonna start with the St. Joseph School in Calgary, and then we're gonna to move to the Ecole Bridge Park <laughs> Elementary in Canada. Sorry, my French is terrible. <laughs> then we'll move to Grisham Middle School in Austin, Texas. And then, let's see. Um, and then to the Maddox Public School in Maddox, Canada. I think that's everyone that's on the call right now. Um, if not, if I didn't say your name, I'll get to you on the sidebar. But yes, why don't we start with um, St. Joseph School, fourth grade, calling from Calgary. I'm going to unmute your unmute your mic right now. Um, what kind of turtle is the biggest? Excuse, what did you say? What kind of turtle is the biggest? Oh, what kind of turtle is the biggest? Oh, that, that's a good question. So actually, one of the biggest turtles is probably that uh, snapping turtle that I showed you a picture of. And so that wasn't the biggest snapping turtle that I've ever seen, but some of them are, are massive. Like, you know, all my hands don't even fit on the screen to show you how big they are, but they can, they are, they're rarely the biggest ones. And so they're actually nocturnal. And so it's, it's really kind of rare to see them and they look sort of scary, but they're, they're generally pretty shy and they like to hide in the dark spaces. Uh, in springs kind of around the edges or under a dock or something uh, until when you do find them it's, it's pretty exciting so okay. yeah thank you awesome question our next class we are moving to um, looks like Miss Mark's class the fifth sixth grade class in Canada I'm um, gonna unmute your mic feel free to step forward and ask your question <laughs> What can we do to bring life and health back to the aquifers that are unhealthy? Great question. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that's something that I've been working a lot with in Florida. And I think one of the things that's been really challenging is that there's been a lot of science that's happened in the springs and, you know, ecological problems like having, you know, more algae in our aquifers or having decreased water flows and everything are, are really complex and so there's not one specific solution that can always you know cause the springs to uh, return to their their natural state or return to how they were before and so i think one thing that's important is for us to all kind of sit at the table together and talk to people because a lot of times we'll start to alienate certain groups like blame everything on the farmers or blame everything on industry or blame everything on on other people but without really seeing how our everyday actions can impact our water and i would really just encourage all of you guys to understand where your water comes from and you know how what you do at home impacts the water so the different decisions that you make and so help uh, use less water at home and also encourage others to use less water but maybe look into other whether it's other careers or other ways that you can um, can learn more about your your water and also help other people understand um, their water too because I think one of the biggest problems with our aquifers is that people don't understand that they oftentimes live right above them and really impact them in their their everyday lives that was a great question. Do you guys have a guess? Do you have a, a response to the prompt that Jenny gave earlier? 
Does anyone want to take a stab at it since you guys are on the mic right now? Oh, someone's coming up. Wild yes. guesses? <laughs> Um, my guess is that it was coming from netters who are scooping up through the ocean like that. They come through a lot in the summer, and they will come through and take it off. Me and my parents go fishing a lot, and we can see them out there. And they will come through the oceans and they just take everything off the floor. That's a, that's a great guess, actually, because in some places, uh, some springs, manatees will come in and or turtles will come in and they all eat a lot of vegetation. And so they'll just kind of, you know, level out everything that's in there and eat all of it. That's that's a great guess. Jomi, does anyone else want to guess or should I should I give you guys the answer? Anybody else here want to guess? Why don't we can we can go through. Why don't we go through one more class? Sure. Uh, Anyone, and then we'll see. Then you can, we can, <laughs> we'll try and get we'll reveal it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll cool. reveal it then. All righty, moving on to our next class. And, um, oh man, this is the one that I keep pronouncing wrong. I can tell it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try again. Um, the Madoc Public School in Madoc, Canada. I'm going to unmute your mic now. Please come to the camera. Okay, so move up. There. Hi. Hi. How long do your tanks last in the aquifers? How long do what last? How long do your oxygen tanks last in the aquifers? Oh. Great question. So uh, we will wear two tanks uh, on our side and then a lot of times you can also bring in other tanks and do what's called the stage dive where you essentially swim in with more and leave them, drop them as you swim in and then when you come out you can pick up more tanks and swim out. And so. One thing that's pretty universal to all diving uh, is that when you're breathing compressed air, which is what's in the tanks, it's a uh, compressed air that's in there, um, you, how much you breathe is dependent on the depth that you're at. So if you are at 60 feet, for example, you're going to breathe, go through your air a lot more slowly than if you were at, you know, 150 feet and you're going to breathe through your air a lot faster at that depth. So you're limited by the depth that you're at and it's also, uh, partly uh, you're, you're limited by the amount of time you can spend underwater, also by um, the amount of nitrogen that's building up in your system. And so after a certain point, you'll have to do what's called decompression. So even if you still have air left, sometimes you have to come up uh, and go shallower in order to off gas some of the nitrogen that's build up, built up in your system. So yeah, that's, that's a great question. And does that class want to take a stab at the prompt from Jenny? <laughs> Oh, just yeah, that, no. <laughs> she does not. <laughs> oh, oh, does not. Does anyone else in that class want to take a shot at it? Anybody else here got <laughs> No, I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's, is that a yes or a no? I can't tell. <laughs> I'm I'm not not no. <laughs> I think no. Okay. We can pass for now. All right, back to <laughs> okay. in a little bit. And then over to our class. Um, it, it looks like in the library, the class calling from Grisham Middle School in Austin. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Um, uh, hi. Hi. So, have you ever encountered anything dangerous in the aquifers? That's a, that's a good question too. So inside the aquifer, the stuff that lives there is mostly, you won't see very much stuff actually living in there. Um, but there's those, these really cool, tiny little cave crayfish that are this big that are white. And then also little cave amphipods, which are a similar size, maybe a little smaller and also white. Um, some catfish will sometimes get in there, but really the most dangerous part of the aquifer isn't necessarily what's living in it, but it's more just the fact that um, a lot of the bottom is really silty and if you stir that up, you'll lose visibility or that the passageways are really winding and you can it's easy to get lost if you don't know where you're going. And so it's not so much a threat of getting like bit by something or you know eaten by something or you know anything that kind of sounds crazy, but it's, it's more just that a lot of people will die if they go in there and, and can't find their way out or run out of air. Like that good question we just heard about how how long you have in there you have to be very careful about calculating um, how long you can spend in in the caves um, before you come out and so we actually dive by what's called the rule of thirds and so you take however much air you have and divide it into three 
and you swim in until you've used one third, you can swim in until you've used one third of your air, essentially, that's the maximum you wanna go. So then when you turn around, you should technically have twice as much air as you need to get out so that you don't end up, um, end up running out at any, at any point. So when we are going into the springs, though, that to get back to your question a little bit more directly, I guess um, there are a lot of alligators that live in a lot of the springs. Uh, so we wanna kind of be respectful of the fact that they're there and that we're kind of in their house. And uh, we will kind of look before we, we get in to make sure that we're, that we're not gonna startle them. <laughs> Awesome, great question. And uh, does anyone from that group want to respond to Jenny's specific question? Uh, I think it might have to do with pollution. Oh, that's a that's a very good that's a very good guess actually because in a lot of the springs there are is algae that's been starting to grow and take over the native vegetation. And so that can definitely have an impact on it, especially nitrates is one of, are one of the main things that have been uh, looked at in the springs and so the most recent science will say that it's not just nitrates that cause the changes in the springs. You know, it's that combined with potentially less flow coming out of the springs because of over pumping and also uh, other things like maybe there could be herbicides that are entering the water or there could be uh, less dissolved oxygen in the water, which can impact the amount of snails. And so snails eat the algae. And so if there's fewer snails eating the algae, then more of it could grow. And so that's actually a really good guess because pollution is one thing that, that definitely is harming our water. Um, so if no one else has any more guesses, I guess I'll um, show you guys uh, a couple more photos of what it looked like above water during that time so you can see what happened. Uh, so during that one year, I went back and looked, to, looked at uh, the spring above water and found that Basically, this is what the spring generally looks like at the surface, and you can see the clear water there and all the reflections in the trees. And I want you to look specifically at that dock on the left there with the two white uh, signs on it. And this is what it looks like in November. And if anyone lives in the south, so I don't know if you guys in Canada would remember this, but maybe in Texas, right after you had that big hurricane, we were hit by Hurricane Irma. And all of this dark water from the river came in and that dock, I just showed you this dock here, which is like sticking up, um, you know, 10 feet up in the air. It's now completely underwater and I can't get any closer to it than this. And this is how far up the water came. So all of this dark water came up and shaded the plants for almost two weeks and so without any sun plants plants can't live and so they essentially i think our hypothesis right now is that they got shaded out by this water coming up and then um now they're they're trying to recover so that's our uh that's our explanation for now and i'll get back to you once we uh once we find out if, if we're right <laughs> so. fantastic all right mm -hmm. we've got about Five more minutes. So if you guys want to ask another question, uh, instead of going uh, class by class, I don't know if I have time. Uh, if you have a question, why don't you come to the mic, put your head right in front of the camera, and that lets me know that you have a question, and I will unmute it. So someone come on up, and I'll just take the first person. All right, looks like we've got someone. Hi there. Oh. Hi. <laughs> I'm fresh in the um like living in the tunnels? Yeah, that's a great question. So inside the tunnels, uh, really the only fish that you'll see are sometimes catfish, but they're usually really pretty close to the entrance of the cave because since there's no sunlight there, it can't really support, you know, sunlight will support the plants, which form the basis of the ecosystem. And then if there's no sunlight, there's not really any plants. And so there isn't really anything that could then live and eat off of those plants. And so most of the fish that come in are kind of catfish near the entrance that are feeding on like detritus and stuff that has kind of fall down into the water. But above in the springs, there are some really cool fish like the mullet that we saw. There are a lot of different types of sunfish. If you guys have ever swam in like a lake or a pond, I don't know if you've seen sunfish. Uh, they are also in the springs. Um, there are some fish called hog chokers that look like mini flounders that uh, live at the bottom in the sand. And uh, they're, they're only about, you know, like this big. They're pretty small. Um, and they live on the sand, like right around the spring bend. But once you actually go into the tunnels of the aquifer, you, you won't really see, see any fish. But that's why I like to snorkel at the surface, too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. 
All righty, next class. I see, ooh, tie-dye shirt, I see you. All right, I'll turn your mic on. Okay, um, hi. Hello. <laughs> okay, do you have any mentors or people who inspire you to do your job? Definitely, that's been a, a huge part of um, being able to do a lot of the work that I do now. And so, um, for I'm I'm finishing my PhD right now, and so I have a whole committee of people um, that kind of help advise me on my research. And so, my main advisor, whose name is Tom, he is a scientist. He's an ecologist, and he's been really helpful for me to to learn how to become a better scientist and a kind of a better critical thinker and ask better questions. And another person who's been really instrumental in um, helping me be a better writer is um, a woman named Cynthia Barnett and she is uh, she writes about fresh water mostly um, she's working on a book about seashells now and telling the story of climate change through shells which is really cool and she's made my writing a lot better but um, one other thing that's, that's been really helpful is having um, a couple women female um, cave divers that have been pretty inspirational for me um, so since or um, Jill Heiner and uh, Becky Kane shot because there's very few females in cave diving and so I think to be able to see other women in cave diving especially has been really helpful uh, for me and uh, one other thing that's kind of inspired me since I was little, um, and I, I did actually have the chance to meet her a couple months ago, which was really, really cool, um, is Sylvia Earle, who is a pretty famous marine biologist. And uh, since I was a marine biologist and studied that in college, uh, she was someone that I would you know, always follow her work and um, see all the amazing things she was doing. So there's been a lot of people that have inspired me, and I'm really thankful because I think that, you know, Finding a good mentor can be really hard, and um, so in photo wise, I think I've always I've uh, been flipping through the pages of National Geographic since I was a little kid, and seeing Brian Scary's photos kind of gave me a new lens into the the underwater world. So, yeah, that's been super important. So that's a great question. Thank you. Yes, def definitely want to reiterate. Awesome question. Thank you for the, the thoughtful question and Jenny your response. Um, for all the teachers out there, um, Jenny did name a bunch of folks. And I'll definitely try to loop you guys together via email after this. I'm going to share the links not only to the 360 cave, but maybe to some of their bios if you want to pass along to your students if they'd be curious to learn more or if you have, you know, a fun assignment idea that you'd like to uh, incorporate. And we've got one more question. Um, come in. All right, I'm going to turn your mic on. Ready, set, go. Uh, are there any air bubbles in the aquifer that you can breathe? Oh, good question. That's oh yeah, that's really important. Um, so the cool air bubbles you see on the surface, like the reflective ones that you saw there, um, those actually like some people who have gotten lost and stuck in caves. If there are really big air bubbles, some of them I think it kind of has been able to keep them alive for a little while, or you know just enough so that they can hang on until someone comes and finds them. But generally, when you exhale, actually a lot of your breath is um, not oxygen. It's like yeah, it's carbon dioxide that's coming out. And so you wouldn't want to go in there and try to breathe off of those pockets of air because it's not really like a very necessarily like a high percentage of um, what we're breathing. And so you could actually breathe in too much like carbon dioxide and pass out. So <laughs> yeah, you don't always want to want to breathe off of those. But it is it's one of my favorite things to look at in the caves, honestly, because it has those reflections. So it can be really pretty. Great, and I think that's an awesome place to bring it to a close. We've got just about, we're pretty much out of time. But on behalf of the National Geographic Society, uh, I want to thank all of you for joining today. It was really fun. Uh, Jenny, thank you so much for not only talking about, see, you covered so much. We talked about aquifers, <laughs> we talked about hydrology, biology, ecology, safety, and awesome way to loop in the importance of mentorship in writing and storytelling. That's, that's so awesome and very crucial to science. Um, so thank you, everyone. I'm going to uh, end you everyone's mic. And we're going to say goodbye to Jenny and the rest of our friends that joined us today. All right, take care, everyone. Thank you all so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.